other questions? So I will start this around. So please find in your enroll if you want the questions now. Or, um, what I would do is um, turn them in at the end. Because you want to listen to the presentation. <laughs> um, Hopefully. One other little uh, hardware related note is uh, when you ask a question, because we're broadcasting this live on the internet and we're also archiving it for people to watch later, there's a little microphone in front of you. So all you have to do is touch the button that says touch while you're asking the question, and the little red light will be on to indicate that the microphone is working. So I'll guarantee that about 10 times today, someone will start to ask a question and forget to touch the microphone. So just try to remember, and that helps those people participating remotely and then those people uh, participating later on. All right? So I think we're probably ready to start. We got the cue from the camera guy, so. So good afternoon and welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar Series. I'm pleased to introduce Brant Williams, the Director of the City of Portland Office of Transportation. And I'm going to turn it directly over to you, Brant. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here this afternoon to uh, speak with you and fill you in a little bit about uh, transportation here in Portland and about the Office of Transportation for which uh, I'm the Director of. Um, it. Uh, it's transportation in Portland, uh, as most of you probably know, is quite a, a, a science and an art. Um, we've done a lot in transportation here in Portland to do new things, new ways of doing business. And what um, I want to take you through today is just uh, a little bit about what the Office of Transportation is and then talk a little bit about um, some of the programs that we've been successful with, some of the projects. Um, talk about some of the challenges that we face today and also get into some actual s specific projects that we're working on that might be of interest to you. Um, we, Like I said, uh, the Office of Transportation uh, has kind of a history of being very innovative and trying different, different ways of doing transportation in the uh, uh, city uh, jurisdiction, local atmosphere. And so what I'd like to do is, is, is share with you some of those experiences that we've had here and how we've, uh, we think, been uh, successful here in Portland, doing things a little bit different than what other cities have done. Um, I, I guess I'd invite you to go ahead and ask questions. Is that fine, Dr. Bertini? Um, throughout the uh, uh, lecture, if you have any questions as I'm going through the presentation, feel free to raise your hand and I'll try to address them as, as I can. So uh, let's see. Uh, the Portland Office of Transportation um, takes a little bit different approach to how, how we deal with transportation. Um, the, uh, I guess the previous way that uh, uh, transportation departments used to deal with uh, transportation issues in cities was somewhat one-dimensional. We looked at uh, the problems based on how do we move cars from point A to point B and how do we move them as quickly as possible. Um, that, uh, that here in Portland doesn't exist anymore. Maybe 20, 30 years ago it existed, but uh, it doesn't exist here. Um, the automobile pretty much dominated our environments. Uh, it still does for the most part, but uh, uh, starting back in the 30s and 40s, uh, the automobile became so dominant in our uh, urban environment and our planning practices and um, uh, tra traffic engineering practices fed into that. And over time, what we uh, were looking at doing was trying to uh, build as much as we can to provide for traffic and congestion. And this is what many cities look like. And there are roads in Portland that look like that also. But uh, we're trying to do something different than go in this direction. So in Portland, uh, what we're interested in, in doing is looking at protecting our neighborhoods, uh, strengthening the central city, the downtown area here, uh, enhancing main streets and town centers, providing access to jobs throughout the, uh, the city, and moving freight and goods uh, to help keep our economy going and provide all the services that, that we need as citizens. 
And all this goes together to uh, help create a livable city. Now you'll see here that uh, it doesn't really talk too much about actually moving traffic um, because that's, that's uh, kind of the, uh, the, the, the medicine that feeds into creating a, a livable city. This is what we focus in on are these uh, attributes of what we want to do here in the city of Portland. It's not just about moving traffic. So ideally, you know, we end up with a city that uh, people feel proud of, the citizenry feels good about uh, the services that are provided. We don't have to deal with uh, uh, overly congested facilities and uh, we try to uh, keep the trips as minimal as possible uh, within the city of Portland. Our philosophy in the Office of Transportation um, kind of revolves around these four areas. Um, planning has been instrumental in uh, creating the transportation system that we have here in Portland. And it's really, it's not transportation unto itself, it's really the land use and transportation connection. Um, uh, I'm not sure if we were the first ones, but we were one of the first ones to really make that good close tie uh, for transportation and how it works with land use and zoning. And one of the keys is to make sure that land use is used as effectively as possible. Um, what we've strived for in the past are, are more denser development, uh, more mixed use in our development so that if you have a job or um, you, you have services you need to access. You don't have to drive clear across town to get to, get to those uh, locations. So we're, we're looking at mixing the uses and uh, not sec segregating the uses so, so it creates longer trips. We want the trips shorter and fewer, and we want people to have options for taking their trips. So that land use transportation uh, connection is just is so uh, uh, fundamental to how we do transportation in Portland. Uh, providing for a balanced system, uh, we've always emphasized uh, the need to have choices in uh, our travels. Um, we focus a lot on transit, uh, but we also look at uh, bicycle trips, uh, walking trips, uh, any other types of trips uh, other than the automobile. The automobile got uh, a pretty good head start on us, uh, again, back in the 30s and 40s and all the way through uh, till today, the automobile, uh, we're trying to catch up with it. And so our emphasis is really trying to have it such that transit can compete uh, effectively as well as bi if you choose to take bicycle trips or walking trips. Um, it provides for options for folks to take different trips other than just having to hop in the car and drive to your destination. Sustainability is one of the uh, areas that we put a lot of attention to here just lately. Um, Environmental sustainable practices, something that we really focus on as far as uh, recycling uh, the products that we use, recycling asphalt uh, that we grind up. Uh, we end up reusing that asphalt to put back down as new asphalt. Uh, we recycle the leaves that we pick up each year. Uh, we're looking at stormwater management techniques, uh, different ways to use our materials so that, uh, that it's more sustainable practices for the long run. And lastly, innovation. Again, uh, this is something that's been kind of core to, the, to, uh, to my uh, uh, department. And uh, we've always pushed trying to challenge uh, various assumptions and current uh, or past practices that have just come about over years of, uh, because of the way people feel and the way they believe. Some of our, our techniques and practices have just evolved to something where we take them for granted and we need to challenge those and try to do things differently. And so uh, that's a, a very important piece of, of what the Office of Transportation is all about. And I'll get into some of those uh, programs here in a little bit. Uh, just real quickly, the mission statement for uh, the Office of Transportation. Um, some of the, the key uh, words, community, partner. Um, we. Uh, it's, it's extremely important for us to work with other people throughout uh, the uh, metro area to do the best job possible. We're not, uh, we're not a silo. We just don't do transportation unto ourselves. We need to work with uh, citizens. We need to work with other agencies. And so that being a community partner is really key. Also, um, access and mobility, effective and safe access and mobility. That's, those are some of the key pieces that uh, we look at in our business. Just real quickly on the structure of uh, the Office of Transportation, uh, we have three main bureaus. Uh, the Bureau of Transportation Engineering and Development 
is uh, the arm of uh, the Office of Transportation that really does the capital projects, uh, builds the streets, uh, builds the capital improvements. Uh, the Bureau of Transportation System Management uh, does all the operating uh, aspects of it. They operate the signals, uh, put up the signs, make sure the pavement markings are right, uh, and uh, they, they deal a lot with safety and parking in that area also. And then the Bureau of Maintenance, of course, uh, does a lot of the maintenance activities, uh, or all of the maintenance activities. And uh, we've got about a $6 billion system out there that our Bureau of Maintenance is, is responsible for uh, keeping up and keeping in good shape. And so uh, they're a very key piece of the Office of Transportation. Here's a, a number of the various different um, elements that uh, we install, operate, and maintain. Um, as you can see, there's uh, a wide array of things within the public right-of-way that the Office of Transportation is responsible for. Um, just to give you some sense of the size of, of our uh, city and the, and the street network, uh, we have 3,800 miles of streets, and if you laid them end-to-end, -end, you could go from Portland to New York, do a U-turn on Fifth Avenue, and head back to Chicago. Uh, sidewalks, you could have a series of sidewalks extend from Portland all the way down to uh, Dallas. Uh, bikeways, that's something that we've really emphasized the last 10 years or so, and uh, we currently have over 200 miles of bikeways, and again, if you put them end-to-end, -end, you could bike from here to Roseburg. Uh, just to kind of clarify what we do and what we don't do, um, we don't do the state highways here in the city of Portland. Uh, the Willamette bridges are all owned by the county, so all those, uh, there's a series of state bridges like the Markham Bridge and the Fremont Bridge, but all the other bridges uh, are owned by the county, and those include like the Hawthorne, Morrison, Broadway, um, Burnside bridges, and so we have to work closely with uh, the county dealing with those. The bus and light rail systems, uh, of course, are TriMet, and the marine terminals and the airport are under the jurisdiction of the Port of Portland. So again, going back to the partnerships of making the transportation system work, it's, it's so critical that, that we develop good partnerships with these other agencies so that for citizens, users of the system, it looks as seamless as possible and they don't get uh, the runaround, they don't see two different types of services being provided out there, so it's important that we establish those strong partnerships with those agencies. So uh, I want to focus in a little bit on the planning portion of it because, uh, again, that is so critical to how we provide transportation facilities. Um, the, uh, the, the whole transportation uh, system here in Portland is based on a broader transportation plan throughout the region, and it's called the 2040 uh, Regional Transportation Plan, uh, sometimes referred to as the RTP, Regional Transportation Plan. And it's a, it's a combination of, of uh, looking at our overall comprehensive land use plan and bringing it down to a, a, a level where we're looking at uh, various different town centers and regional centers and how those are connected with each other and how they interact with all the various different neighborhoods throughout the region. Um, as you can see, the, the big circle in the middle, that's the, that's the, that's the key uh, central city area, of course. And then throughout the region, we have what are called town centers and regional centers, such as Gateway, uh, Hillsdale, Multnomah, those areas. And we want to focus development in those areas so that the, and then transportation systems that provide a good way to get between the various different centers. We also designate main streets throughout the city so that uh, we know where to focus our efforts as far as businesses and um, uh, street improvements on those, on those facilities. So the regional plan kind of provides that overall basis for what the city of Portland needs to do. Um, a little bit more specific to the city of Portland is the downtown plan, which actually was uh, first pulled together back in 1972. And this is a picture of of the uh, kind of the west side of downtown, or excuse me, the east side of downtown close to the river. And you can see over on the right side of the picture, there's uh, uh, quite a few roads. Uh, one of those is what's now known as Natal Parkway, and then to the right of that is Harbor Drive. Uh, back in 72, there was uh, this Harbor Drive freeway right along the river. And if you've been down to the river now, you know that it's an, a nice park, and it's called Waterfront Park, and it's a, a wonderful amenity for the city of Portland. Well, the downtown plan looked at you know this kind of environment. You can see all the uh, um, all the surface parking lots. You can see all the streets, all the all the land that's taken up for the automobile. And citizens throughout Portland said, you know, we want to do things different. 
And so the downtown plan was instrumental in changing how we do planning and transportation in the downtown area. Um, this is kind of a, on the left side here is kind of a schematic of what the plan is about. Um, as you can see in, in this area, that's where the Harbor Drive Freeway used to be and that was removed and put into a park. Uh, 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 north and south through the main portion of downtown, what's called the spine of the city, is the bus mall or the transit mall. And then east-west uh, focused in on the light rail system, which uh, now exists in downtown. And the whole downtown plan was really focused on you know, trying to uh, encourage more transit uh, uh, use, trying to provide more uh, transit options in downtown, increase the bus service, provide for light rail and streetcar. And also, again, looking at parking and how we could do a better job of managing parking in the downtown area so we just didn't have surface parking lots everywhere. If you go downtown uh, today, uh, there's only a few remaining uh, uh, blocks or lots that have surface parking on them. So uh, we've been fairly su successful in getting uh, rid of those surface lots and providing good, solid uh, development in the downtown area. At the same time, having created so much demand for, the, the, for traffic and uh, automobile access to downtown uh, that we haven't had to build new bridges or anything trying to get into downtown. So the overall plan to date has been extremely successful, trying to get people out of their cars, giving them options to take uh, light rail or bus or even ride their bike or walk into downtown to, to go to work. Um, that was a localized plan. Uh, what the City of Portland just recently adopted was what we call our Transportation System Plan, which is the overall plan for the s transportation plan for the City of Portland. And it focused on these uh, uh, five areas. Uh, again, choices, giving citizens transportation choices other than just taking your automobile. Stewardship of the system, that's our, one of our number one responsibilities, is just making sure that the system stays in good shape so that it doesn't cost future generations more money than, uh, than need be. 2040 growth, again, tying this with what the regional plan is all about, 20, the 2040 plan. And again, environmental and economic sustainability, making sure that we, when we do our business, we do it the right way for the long term. And of course, safety. Um, safety is a key aspect of everything we do uh, to try to s protect uh, citizens and uh, people who use the system and try to minimize the number of accidents that occur. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, I guess, all the various different areas where Portland's been fairly successful. And in fact, we've been leaders in many areas uh, throughout the country and sometimes throughout the world in transportation. Um, bicycles, pedestrian, traffic calming, uh, intelligent transportation systems, ITS, uh, is something that you may have heard about. Um, that's kind of the smart technology that goes into making our systems work well. Parking management. Uh, TDM, Transportation Demand Management, trying to manage the demand on the system, light rail and streetcar. Uh, for the bicycle program, uh, we started out, instead of just going out and trying to do a whole bunch of bike lanes or whatever, to do it right, we, we knew we had to do a master plan. So we developed a bicycle master plan, I think it was about 10 or 15 years ago now, 10 years ago. And we looked at trying to overcome some of the key barriers in uh, keeping people, that keep people off of their bikes. And you know, when we talk to citizens, they say, you know, we feel unsafe. Uh, there's not enough good facilities. And uh, when we talk to them, you know, people just had misperceptions about, you know, what it really took to to actually hop on your bike and and, and pedal to work. Uh, once you get beyond those, uh, people kind of woke up and said, hey, we can do this. And um, we've seen just a, a significant increase in the number of bicycle riders coming into downtown and throughout the city because of this master plan. Uh, I think across the Hawthorne Bridge right now, we have somewhere around 4,000 4, people that, that uh, cross the Hawthorne Bridge coming in and out of uh, downtown. In total, on all the bridges, we have somewhere over 8,000 uh, 8, bicyclists coming in and out of downtown. This is what the bike system looked like back in 73. And just a series of slides that shows you how it's developed over time. The, um, I believe the uh, kind of the uh, purple lines are actual bike, uh, bike paths, the blue lines are bike lanes, and the green lines are bike boulevards. And you can see by 93 it's starting to expand quite a bit, and by 98 we have a pretty good system in place. And it hasn't changed a whole lot since 98 because we've 
Uh, we just haven't had the resources to, to get out there and, and put in more bike lanes. And then ideally, the, the recommended uh, plan is to have bike lanes and bikeways throughout the city on almost all of our major streets. So uh, eventually we'd like to get there. Um, it's going to be a challenge for us to, to, ha to complete that level of plan, but uh, the system that we have in place we feel is very effective right now. Here's just an example, Northeast Gleason Street, before we did any, uh, before we were thinking about how to do things different uh, in, in the way of bikes. So you had four lanes of traffic. You see you didn't have very many, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> we didn't have much traffic on that street, parking on both sides, which is a good thing. We tried to, <coughs> excuse me, we tried to encourage parking on the street. And so we, we looked at the traffic volumes and realized that we could neck it down and we could get it down to two lanes each direction and provide a, a refuge in the middle for traffic to turn to get those cars out of the way. And that gave us enough room to put in bike lanes on both sides of the street. And it makes just a world of difference if you're out there bicycling on those streets. And because of some of the efforts that we've done, uh, this is the second time, actually, that uh, Portland's uh, got, gotten the award for <clears throat> Best Overall City for Bikes. And so uh, we feel pretty, uh, pretty good about that. Um, in the pedestrian area, we, did the, we took the same approach. We looked at the pedestrian master, we developed a pedestrian master plan, which focused on these uh, five areas. And I, I want to point out the pedestrian design guidelines. That was a whole separate document that uh, really took a concerted effort to say, how can we design our sidewalks and our pedestrian ways different so that they're, they're more attractive to pedestrians, uh, pedestrians feel more comfortable, they, they don't feel unsafe when they're using them. And that uh, particular document has been um, something that has gone nationwide. Uh, we get calls for it all the time about, you know, what please share this uh, good document with us because it's uh, won awards and it's really considered one of the uh, premier um, things that we produced here in the city of Portland. So uh, some of the principles for p good pedestrian design, uh, safety, make sure that it's accessible to all and of course there's the um, uh, ADA standards that we have to comply with, uh, federal standards. Uh, make sure that all everything's connected, um, the system's easy to use, it's a good place, um, multi-purpose and economical. So uh, <coughs> ideally, you know, all of our pedestrian ways would have some kind of features like that. The master plan got into looking at various different projects that we have to do throughout the city and we're uh, currently trying to implement all those projects. Uh, here's just an example of trying to create a safer environment for pedestrians as they're crossing a fairly uh, major street and we provide these uh, refuge medians and I don't know if you've experienced these before but they really do give you a sense of, uh, of, of safety when you get out there and you only have to cross one one leg of the street at the time so instead of having to look both ways you can cross one portion of the street then get out in the middle and cross the next portion. Um, here's curb extensions, an example that we use quite uh, a lot throughout the city of Portland to help pedestrians get across the street uh, and in general I guess we're just trying to create you know overall very friendly neighborhoods that uh, folks feel comfortable about taking their trips by walking versus again having to hop in the car and drive. Traffic calming is another area that um, uh, the Office of Transportation has been uh, a leader in. Um, we were one of the first ones to take a look at how, how do you use speed bumps, traffic circles to try to slow down traffic in, in our neighborhoods. Uh, again, as you remember, uh, protecting our neighborhoods is one of our key uh, uh, things that we need to accomplish. And so uh, traffic calming is, is a mechanism for trying to slow down traffic, trying to make our neighborhoods safer when it comes to transportation and uh, overall make our city more of a livable environment. Uh, some of the tools that we use, uh, speed bumps, um, median slow points, and traffic circles. Here's some examples of a speed bump, which I'm sure you've all experienced. Uh, median slow points, uh, these are, uh, we try to create some level of friction for the driver as you're driving down the street so you just don't have a, a wide open uh, roadway to just go down at 40, 50 miles an hour, but there's some friction points that slow you down and give you some perspective of going through a neighborhood and trying to drive a little bit slower. 
Traffic circles, we put these in the middle of intersections. We haven't used these much lately because of the cost associated with them. And the speed bumps are a more economical and uh, effective tools, so we've pretty much focused on speed bumps uh, the last few years. Uh, I mentioned Intelligent tr Transportation Systems, ITS. Um, for those of you who are more in the high-tech area, this is um, uh, versus the planning or policy area. This, this is an area that um, uh, requires a lot of technical knowledge and how the traffic signal works um, is, uh, uh, again, a very high-tech uh, area of our business. A um, couple different types of ITS programs, signal priority for buses. Uh, this is um, a tool that we use to try to help the, the buses stay on time. If they're falling behind schedule, what we can do is we can advance the green so that uh, the buses, as they approach an intersection, they get an early green um, so that they can get through that intersection a little bit quicker. Uh, and we can delay, we can delay the red um, so that, uh, again, it works best for buses. And uh, that's been a very effective program for us. Uh, again, working with TriMet, um, our partner that deals with transit, uh, they, they felt that this is an extremely successful program and we want to incorporate it more throughout the city. Another ITS program is the, just our overall traffic signal system. And we have a s traffic signal system that's uh, hooked up to one location and it controls all the signals throughout the city. And so we have operators who can adjust the various times of the signals so that it works best as traffic changes throughout the day. Then this last example is, um, has to do more with how we deal with incident management on our freeways uh, associated with uh, uh, accidents that occur and delays in the freeway system. When an accident occurs on I-5, as in this example at I-5 in Barber in the south portion of town, Traffic can then go over to Barber, a parallel facility, uh, another highway, and use Barber Boulevard to, uh, to avoid the accident on I-5. And so we've set up systems so that once that accident happens, we can inform motorists of the problem. We can help them get over to this uh, secondary facility and actually change the signal timing so it works most effective for them to, to get to where they're going. And when, when I first got into the business, we actually built a whole big building just for the traffic control system. But as in all of our computer systems these days, they've gotten much smaller. And so all we really need is uh, basically a PC to run our control system and a, a, a series of, of very technical communication systems that uh, communicate with all the intersections out in the field. Uh, parking regulations, as I mentioned in the downtown plan, is a key area for trying to manage uh, uh, traffic in the downtown area. At one point, we actually had a lid on parking uh, supply in the downtown so that developers couldn't come in and put in more parking. Uh, over a period of years, that became problematic as far as uh, allowing for a, a, a vital growing downtown. And so we removed the lid, and we, we have other types of parking regulations today that actually work a little bit better than just putting a cap on parking. Uh, but uh, we manage the parking in downtown, the on-street parking, and zoning codes and everything manage the off-street parking, all the parking garages. And we have to work closely with the on-street and the off-street parking to make sure that those regulations are such that uh, we don't provide too much parking and get too many trips coming into downtown, and at the same time trying to encourage uh, people to take transit. Um, just here recently, we've uh, taken out uh, somewhere around 6,000 uh, of our single space meters and put in what are called smart meters. And um, these are, uh, I guess, we're the first city in the country to do a wholesale change on all our parking meters. And we're finding out that these uh, smart meters, even though there's a few complications with them, they're, they're working very well. And uh, it's uh, kind of the next stage of parking in downtown. If any of you have driven around downtown and parked lately, you probably run into these meters, and hopefully they've worked for you. Uh, travel demand management is another area that we focus in on, um, trying to uh, manage the demand for traffic uh, in, in the Portland area. And we look at uh, how can we change behaviors. Uh, again, back in the 40s, 50s, people wanted to hop in their car. They wanted to drive everywhere. Uh, but there are alternative ways of, of thinking about your trips. And so uh, we have a, a program in place in the Office of Transportation that just looks at uh, uh, travel demand management, and it's actually called the Options Division to, to uh, emphasize the need to provide for other options for travel. And 
this is one program that they've found to be very successful. We're the first city in the country to uh, implement a program like this. It's called Travel Smart. And again, it's a behavioral change program. Uh, it's been successful in many cities in Europe and one city in Australia, Perth. And uh, I, th I think one of the uh, best things that we've seen about it is that it reduces the vehicle miles traveled. That's what VMT is, vehicle miles traveled by 14%. Here in Portland, we had a, um, it was a pilot project in the uh, southwest area around Multnomah. And we uh, surveyed 600 uh, homes, and we actually went door to door and talked face to face with people and talked with them about their travel patterns, uh, their travel behaviors, and what keeps them from taking transit or riding their bike or whatever. And we'd provide them with information and kind of help aware, uh, uh, raise their level of awareness on all the various different types of options that they have available to them, other than, again, just hopping in their car. And uh, Based on some preliminary studies that we've done, we've seen a fairly significant reduction in the number of auto trips that those, uh, those households have been taking. In fact, their percent of transit and bike and walking trips has gone up, say, I think it's around 27%. So we've seen some real good outcomes from this particular program. So we're trying to shift them out of uh, using single occupant vehicle trips to other types of modes. And Here's just, uh, if you've been to the Multnomah Hillsdale area, this is Multnomah Village. And uh, one other program that our, our options division has been looking at is uh, called the Carpool Match Northwest. And what it is, it's a GIS-based uh, program that tries to um, match up various different uh, people who want to carpool. Uh, previously, you used to have to call a carpool uh, hotline and then someone there would try to match you up. But this is all online, and you, people can register, and then you can see where all the other carpoolers are. And I believe, once again, this is uh, the first type of program like this in the country. Uh, regarding light rail, um, uh, the light rail system, again, is owned and operated by TriMet. We work very closely with TriMet in implementing the light rail system. This uh, uh, slide actually shows the the two main lines that are in place today, we call them the, the east, east side line that goes out to Gresham, then the west side that goes out to Hillsboro. Uh, east side, I think, was opened up in 1986, and west side, uh, 1998, uh, I believe, 97, somewhere in there. And um, both of those two lines have been extremely successful. The ridership numbers are much higher than, uh, than even what we had forecasted. And we're, uh, just a few couple years ago, we opened up the uh, airport line that goes up to the airport off of Gateway. It's uh, over off of I-205. And then we're currently working on the interstate uh, light rail line that should open up next spring. And then we have a couple other projects that I'll talk about here in a little bit uh, regarding light rail. Here's just a slide of the airport uh, max uh, out at the airport. And uh, one other area that, uh, again, I'll talk a little bit more about later is the streetcar. Now, the streetcar is, is a program that uh, the city actually owns and operates. Um, uh, so it's one of the few transit-type facilities that, uh, that, that we maintain and take care of. The city of Portland was the first one to put in one of these modern streetcars. And uh, of course, it's right down below us here. And hopefully, many of you had a, have had an opportunity to use it. Some of the uh, current challenges that we have uh, in the Office of Transportation, um, even though we've implemented a lot of good programs over the year, we're still seeing vehicle miles travel uh, skyrocket. Um, you can look at since 1980, our population has gone up 20%. In that same amount of time, our vehicle miles traveled within the Portland area has uh, doubled uh, the population growth, 40%. Uh, this is kind of an interesting slide. If, um, if you take all the vehicle miles traveled throughout uh, the Portland area and you uh, put them end to end and took them around the moon, that, that would take you 56 laps around the moon. And, so that, and that happens daily. So that's a lot of, lot of travel. Uh, our roads and streets were initially built for horse and buggy and the old trolley system. And our, our roads just weren't... Um, built to, to deal with the kind of uses that we have today. Uh, 
the 18 wheelers, the, the heavy buses, if you've seen some of the bus stops uh, adjacent to curbs, they, they get the, the, the pavement gets uh, really worn and um, we have to go back in and maintain that area uh, a lot. Uh, just uh, an example of, of the pavement issues that we have. Um, the deterioration of our system, it's an old system, it's overused. Um, and we're not able to keep up with it. And so we have a lot of programs in place to try to uh, figure out you know, where the streets are going bad, how quickly are they going bad, and uh, hopefully use the resources that we have as efficiently as possible to keep streets from getting into that poor pavement condition. Unfortunately, we're, we're losing ground, and um, uh, the, the citizens are not happy with that, in fact. Uh, same way with bridges. Um, we have a number of bridges out there that are in very poor condition and, and need quite a bit of work. Uh, the extent of our deteriorated infrastructure is just enormous. Uh, here's kind of a picture of how, um, or a chart of how the deteriorated infrastructure has occurred over years. And you can see the pavement, bridges, and traffic signals have, have really uh, gone down over the last few years. Bridges actually went up a little bit. Uh, given the number of bridges that we have, we have somewhere around 170 bridges that we maintain. We, d we had some money and did some special work on a few bridges, and it bumped back up uh, in 97, 98, but uh, we're declining again. Uh, so what has brought about that problem is the issue around the gas tax. Uh, the gas tax was last raised 10 years ago, and it's a 20, here at the state of Oregon, it's 24 cents. And given inflation and fuel efficiency, we haven't been able to keep up with uh, the growing demand on our system. So um, it's, it's amazing. When we go out to a boat, uh, when we ask the public about uh, spending more, investing more in transportation, uh, they, they're very reluctant to even raise the gas tax two or three pennies. Um, it's, it's amazing how, how much emotion that brings out in citizens, just uh, talking about a two, three, four cent increase in the gas tax, when throughout the year we see fluctuation in gas prices of somewhere 50 to 75 cents. Yes, sir. I, I guess I'm, I'm confused about this issue. I, mean, I, I guess, to begin with, I disagree with the second bullet, cars are more fuel efficient. I think that we, we've all been told that just hasn't happened. I mean, the, the average, you know, the corporate average fleet efficiency is, is worse than it was 20 years ago. So cars aren't using less gasoline, and your previous slide showed a huge increase in total miles driven. So why don't we have a huge increase in total revenue available? Well, actually, the revenue has gone up over years because there are more miles driven, so people are driving more and buying more gasoline. However, that's, we, we are seeing a, a decrease in fuel efficiency. Um, now, I don't have the data to, to, to debate with you on that, but uh, the information that we have, uh, the actual gas tax paid per mile has gone down. From the, the first uh, uh, chart is 1972. For each mile driven, we collected about 2.4 cents. To, uh, in 2000, we collected about 1.3 cents mile driven. The, the typical automobile fuel efficiency has definitely gone down over that period of time. If we see uh, that trend continue, um, we're looking at in the year 2020 uh, being down to a half a penny per, per mile driven. And that's going to have a significant impact on our revenue. And I, I would anticipate that this is going to happen, looking at all the alternative fuels that uh, are coming on the market these days and just the uh, uh, changes in, in how uh, automobiles and engines work. So I, th this, doesn't, this wouldn't surprise me at all if we see this trend continue. Uh, another thing that affects Portland itself is that the, the state gas tax is distributed based on population. And as the rest of the state grows, <clears throat> Uh, the city of Portland becomes a smaller proportion of the entire state, so it affects the Office of Transportation revenue. Uh, uh, so on top of the fuel efficiency and the inflation, this piece of it doesn't, uh, doesn't help us. And so when you, when you project out into like the year 2020, if you look at inflation and fuel efficiency, the gas tax would have to be raised by 36 cents just to keep up with where we are today. And of course, 
since uh, the citizens aren't happy with even two or three cents, uh, we don't think that this is going to be the solution to our, our problem. So uh, uh, what has this meant to citizens over the past five years? Um, we've had to eliminate a number of our programs, and a number of these are the programs that I just uh, spoke about that uh, we felt like we, we've been leaders uh, throughout the country. Uh, traffic calming, uh, bike and pedestrian capital programs, uh, school safety, these are, these are critical programs that we've had to uh, basically eliminate because of our funding situation. Here's a number of programs that we haven't eliminated, but we've made significant reductions to. And you'll notice planning is one of those. Um, transportation options, which deals with, uh, again, transportation demand management. These, these are critical issues for us, and it's, it's uh, really a concern that we're not going to be able to continue to be as aggressive in dealing with traffic issues as we have in the past. Uh, here's just an example of uh, what happens when you defer street maintenance. As you notice on the previous slide, uh, pavement preservation was one area that we had to cut back in. If we cut back in pavement preservation, uh, it ends up costing us in the long term a lot more than it does currently. Um, so for 75% life of, the, of a street or uh, section of pavement, uh, we get pretty good uh, life out of that pavement and restoring it could cost like up to a, a dollar for this case. If you go another 12 percent worth of time, it ends up costing us four to f uh, five dollars. Um, so it's really critical that we address our pr pavement preservation needs early on and before the, the pavement gets into a place where it's uh, uh, creating a large liability for the citizens. Some of the other challenges that we uh, are up against um, Given our economic climate that we're, we're in today, uh, providing access to employment areas is critical. Uh, as our roadways become more congested um, and we're not in the business of providing additional uh, roadway capacity, it, it really puts a constraint on freight mobility. So freight mo mobility has, has kind of risen as one of the key issues that we have to look at. Uh, stormwater management, given all the environmental concerns and regulations, uh, managing the stormwater that falls on our streets and how it gets into the, uh, how it uh, drains into the, the ground, subsurface areas, and how it gets ship, shipped out to our uh, treatment facilities is something that we're going to be focusing in on. Also, biking and walking to school, we've noticed a significant trend lately that um, uh, kids aren't walking or biking to school. Uh, the vast majority of kids are go getting to school by uh, their parents taking them to school these days. Creates a lot of traffic and congestion and safety issues around schools. We're, we're trying to change that trend and trying to get p uh, kids back on their bikes, back to walking to school. And we've got to do that through a number of ways, making sure that uh, kids feel safe, that parents think their kids are safe walking to school, that they have sidewalks, that they have bike lanes to use. Um, just changing how people think about how they take their trips. And so, and we'd like to really focus in on the kids because that's where, that's where our culture is going to change. It's, it's hard to get uh, some of us older adults to change our habits, but if we can affect kids, that, that would be a, a, a good start to change in how we, uh, how we take our trips. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the projects that we're currently working on. Um, the Portland Streetcar. Again, uh, Portland was the, the first city to put in a modern streetcar, and the line runs from uh, northwest Portland, just right down here, about a block from, uh, from where we are right here, is the southern terminus. And the whole purpose of the streetcar was really to provide a, a circulator in the downtown area that would help facilitate development and rejuvenate certain areas of downtown and provide for connections between key destinations in the downtown area. Uh, it's been an extremely successful uh, project, and um, we're currently looking at ex extending the, the line in two or three different directions. Uh, Portland has a rich history of, of trolleys and streetcars. Uh, anytime, it seems like when we go out and do a paving project, we grind up the old asphalt, we run into old streetcar lines. Uh, streetcar lines just uh, pretty much set the pattern for how our transportation system uh, was laid out uh, in the early 1900s. And, um, and we're in the business of trying to replicate that a little bit. Um, 
Here's a good picture of the streetcar as it's up in the Pearl District, River District area. So this is kind of the schematic of what we we're trying to accomplish with the streetcar. Connect the River District, which was an old railroad yard, uh, with what was called North McAdam, is now called South Waterfront, which is just south along the river, south of downtown. It's an old industrial area that uh, really is prime for redevelopment and uh, is currently in the process of redeveloping. Uh, here's just a, a picture of what the River District looked like before a lot of the redevelopment has taken place. You can see the, the viaduct that's called the Lovejoy Viaduct that goes along the, the bottom of the slide. One, uh, that was the, the second key project that we had to do was to take down that Lovejoy Viaduct so that it brought it down to grade and allowed for good development to occur uh, throughout the River District. So combination of removing the Lovejoy Viaduct and putting in, putting in the streetcar um, really was kind of the incentive for the property owners in that area to start making that a whole new neighborhood. And I'm sure you've been up there and uh, have enjoyed many of the amenities that are in the Pearl District, River District area. Here's just a picture of the South Waterfront area. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's very close to the central city, but it, you know, it looks like it um, uh, could be miles away from downtown. It's just prime for good redevelopment. Uh, the streetcar alignment, uh, it's interesting. Uh, if, then if you orient yourself, north is this way. And uh, Good Samaritan Hospital up in northwest on 23rd, that's the upper uh, terminus of the streetcar. The streetcar line connects the, the highest density neighborhood in, or in the state of Oregon, connects it to the highest employment base in the state of Oregon, and it also connects on the south end to Portland State University, which is the uh, largest university in the state of Oregon by enrollment. So the streetcar line really does connect some key elements of the downtown area. Some of the, the principles that we had in building the streetcar, uh, we had a, a good public-private partnership uh, with uh, some of the key de developers and business owners in the area. Uh, we wanted to keep it simple, our con construction techniques, uh, uh, our philosophy was to get in and out of each block within a three-week period. And, uh, that's critical for businesses because they need to keep operating, need to keep their revenue flows. And when you come in with a major project like this, they were very much concerned about how much it was going to impact them. So we tried to keep it as simple as possible, get in and get out of there. And overall, the, uh, the property owners along the streetcar line thought it was extremely successful. Minimize construction impacts uh, along those lines and build a strong team. Um, we couldn't have done it without that good, strong public-private uh, partnership. And, um, working through a number of issues that had come up. So the streetcar is really not so much a transit tool, a transportation tool, but it's more of a development tool. Um, and along those lines, it's been very successful. We've seen approximately a billion dollars worth of development uh, within a block or two of the streetcar line. And again, that was one of the primary purposes of the streetcar was to help build new neighborhoods and provide for that kind of development that uh, would decrease the number of trips that uh, need to come into downtown. I think the estimate is, is that based on the uh, zoning that occurred for the River District, the change in zoning because the streetcar went in, uh, the number of trips coming into the city was reduced by a third of what uh, would have been with previous zoning, which was mostly office. Here's just a kind of a before picture of area in the River District. And here's a picture, of course, of after. And these are the kind of environments that we're trying to create throughout the city. And uh, we feel that all the various different types of modes and the street activity and the urban design characteristics of the street are what uh, uh, lead to these kind of in, uh, scenes. The next, uh, uh, we have actually two extensions of the streetcar line that we're looking at. The first one is a little bit off the, the chart here, but it goes down into South Waterfront. And it extends from PSU here, goes down to the river, uh, and then down into South Waterfront. And we're hoping to get started with the first leg of that down to the river sometime uh, this next year and then get down into the South Waterfront area by 2006. 
The third extension is what we call the east side streetcar line, which uh, goes over to the east side of the river, connects up on MLK and Grand, and then uh, loops down and could come across the Hawthorne Bridge or across a new light rail bridge once we look at extending the light rail project. So um, we, we call this the, the Ringstrasse. If any of you have ever been to Vienna, Austria, they have a, a transit circulator that goes around the entire city called the Ringstrasse. And so we're trying to, I guess, replicate that. Uh, a little bit about the, uh, the South Waterfront District development. Um, as in the River District, where we were looking at uh, new housing, upwards of 5,000 new housing units, in the South Waterfront area, we're looking at a combination of office and housing. Um, somewhere around, I think it's uh, 3,700 new homes, uh, new housing units, and 9,000 new jobs will occur in this area. We've just recently uh, worked out a development agreement with um, property owners and OHSU to make sure that this development occurs and that they have good transportation facilities to get in and out of that area. It's somewhat uh, of an island because it's bounded by the river on the east side and then you have I-5 on the west side and it's really difficult to access in and out of South Waterfront. So two key pieces of making this work had to do with extending the streetcar down into the South Waterfront area. And then the second piece is what many of you probably heard is the, the tram connection up to OHSU up on the hill. Uh, the, the development agreement would not have taken place. We would not be seeing the kind of development that uh, they anticipate putting in without having some guarantees that streetcar and tram would, would go and service this area. Here's just a little bit bigger schematic on how the streetcar is going to access. Uh, it says North McAdam, but it's now called South Waterfront. And then you can see the alignment for, for the tram. In looking at the tram, um, OHSU was very interested in having uh, reliable, quick access between the area that they need to expand to down on, down on the waterfront and their main campus up here uh, on the hill. We looked at various different ways to provide for uh, access between South Waterfront and the hill. And we did travel time studies and looked at how, how could we provide maybe a shuttle service or whatever to get, to get doctors and uh, patients back and forth. And because of the way the roadway network has been laid out over the years with uh, I-5, with Barber, with Twilliger, uh, everything runs north-south and pretty much bisects anything that could go east-west. And so it's very convoluted on how you could get up to the hill. And we did travel time studies, and the time that it takes to travel any one of those routes was just unacceptable, uh, unacceptable to OHSU. So that's when they came up with the idea of how about a tram. And so, uh, of course, this isn't Portland. I'm not sure where this is, Rio de Janeiro or someplace. But um, uh, based on where we are now, uh, we can expect to have a tram in place within the, the next two years and up and operational to provide access for uh, not just OHSU, but uh, citizens who want to access between those two areas of the city. So here's a little bit more detail on what the alignment look, looks like. It goes right up Gibb Street, uh, crosses I-5, crosses Barber and Twilliger, and uh, there, there's only one uh, tower that's needed to put in the tram. Uh, it's just a, a free span from there all the way up to, up to the hill. And one of the big issues is that the tram goes over a neighborhood. It's, it's actually uh, in a historic neighborhood. And the people that live there, of course, had a lot of concerns about, you know, what will that mean to our neighborhood and what, what does that mean to us, you know, using our homes and being out in our yards or whatever. And concern was, of course, visibility, noise, uh, uh, visual uh, nuisance, something going overhead. Uh, probably the, the biggest issue, though, was people being able to look down into your, into your home or into your backyard. And there's ways that we can deal with that from a design standpoint, either through louvered windows or some type of platform that's around the, the tram car so that you, can't, you can only see straight out, you can't see down. So we're able to work through that issue. Um, we've got the tram high enough so that it doesn't, uh, of course, impact any of the, the physical aspects of the neighborhood. There will be the vis uh, visual aspect of it as you're looking up at the tram, but it'll be extremely quiet. Um, of course, no air pollution associated with it, so that's really a, a very cost-effective, um, 
very um, uh, ec uh, ecologically good way to provide for access between North McAdam and, uh, or excuse me, South Waterfront and the OHSU. Okay, a little bit about the light rail system. Um, as I mentioned to you before, we have the, the, both the east, west, east line and the west line. Uh, we have the airport line, and we, we just are putting in the interstate line up to Expo, up to the Columbia River. Uh, the next two phases of, this, of the light rail, uh, the first half of the first phase over on the right side of the, the screen goes down I-205 down to uh, Clackamas Town Center. And it will provide good transit services for southeast Portland. The other half of the first phase is redoing the transit mall in downtown, uh, 5th and 6th Avenue, and putting light rail down 5th and 6th Avenue uh, where the buses now go. Uh, it doesn't do away with the bus service, so it'll complement buses. So we'll have, we're working on designs that to try to um, provide for uh, service by both buses and light rail so that they can mix. There's also a big push to provide for auto access on the mall. And so we're, try we're trying really hard to try to work all three of those together and see, if, see what kind of impacts having all three on the mall th throughout the entire length of the mall would do for operations and safety and transit uh, impacts. So uh, then the second phase, uh, which we don't have uh, uh, a, a good plan for yet as far as financing and building, is phase two that goes from PSU down to um, Milwaukee. So hopefully we can look forward to that in the next 10 years or so. Uh, just a little bit about the transit mall project. Um, and here's just a, a slide of what the mall looks like. I think this is down towards uh, Burnside, I'm not sure. But um, right now there's just buses on the mall, and as you can see, there's no auto access either in this, in this area. And the, the actual um, uh, scope of the project goes from the steel bridge Trains will come off the steel bridge. They'll, they'll kind of turn more west instead of coming down the existing line. They'll go up to Union Station, and at Union Station, then they'll start heading south and south down uh, Fifth Avenue and come all the way down to PSU, do a turnaround, and go back up to Union Station and back over across uh, the steel bridge. Yes? Um, why would you ever want auto access on the bus mall? Uh, there are businesses and property owners in the downtown area that feel that auto access is important for their businesses, uh, for uh, visibility purposes, for access purposes, uh, to, make the, to make that section of the downtown as, uh, as vital as possible. Um, there's, uh, there definitely is a debate about um, the pros and cons of auto access, and that's one of the issues that we're dealing with right now is what, uh, what are the benefits of actually having through auto access uh, versus the, the negative trade-offs to transit? In a lot of the bus mall, um, it seems to be only wide enough for two buses. And if you have maxes going through there and buses, where will the cars be? Uh, we have plenty of width uh, in the actual right-of-way, but something's going to have to give. And we're either going to have to have buses and autos share a lane or buses and light rail share a lane or take away some of the sidewalk width and provide for additional auto, uh, auto lane by taking out some of the sidewalk width. As a, as a pedestrian, um, primarily, the bus mall is one of the only places in Portland that is really nice to walk, uh, specifically because there aren't cars there. And I think I'm probably not the only person who feels this way. If you put cars on the bus mall, I think it will just make it a very, um, basically, in, in a lot of ways, make it an unpleasant place to walk, as most of Portland is. Well, that's <laughs> one of our concerns. We want to make sure that uh, we maintain the, the pedestrian-friendly aspect of the mall. And that's why we're looking at various different options for how we can uh, try to minimize the impacts to the, the pedestrian space. Uh, providing good transit service is the number one priority, uh, right along with trying to pro maintain that pedestrian environment. Of course, um, providing good transit service could only be um, it, in putting cars on the bus mall. It will necessarily decrease the the quality of transit service on the bus mall. 
it will necessarily decrease the quality of service because there will be cars there and buses will have less opportunity to to drive on the bus mall. If there are only um, buses and max trains, then I think it will flow a lot more smoothly than if there were cars stopping. And also, where will the cars park along the bus mall? Uh, right now, we're not looking at parking, per se, on the bus mall. There might be some turnouts for some truck loading. There might be some turnouts just for some drop-off zones, but uh, we're not looking at for any parking. Um, our, our initial studies, we, we realized real quick that uh, we might be able to get a through auto lane in, but there's no way we could get actual parking al alongside that through auto lane. So the only thing that it would provide is for circulation and access for, for automobile traffic. Um, it definitely will have an impact on, uh, on transit service, and so that's what uh, the community, as we work towards a, a decision on this, is going to have to weigh in is, are the benefits of through auto, do they outweigh the negative aspects of the impacts to transit and to uh, pedestrian, uh, the pedestrian environment? Yes, sir. Has the Department of Transportation done what Ray Polani has asked for for some time now, to look at putting the light rail in a subway system? Uh, yeah, we haven't recently done a study on that, but uh, a, a while back there was a, a, a citizen group that was formed to take a look at various different options for how to deal with uh, transit on the 5th, 6th Avenue through uh, the central city. And they looked at options of, of undergrounding, uh, light rail, uh, shuttle system, circulator system, uh, various different options for how to provide more transit service in the downtown area. And it was concluded that the light rail uh, option was the best option for uh, adding additional transit service for the, for the next you know, 10 to 20 years. And at some point, maybe we might want to look at going underground. Um, and then the, the streetcar, or excuse me, the light rail line could then revert maybe to a streetcar line and uh, work as more of a, a traffic circulator versus a commuter rail service. Are you saying then that you have actually looked at that or you just don't really want to look at, at putting light rail in a subway format? No, the, the, that group did look at it and they looked at the costs associated with doing it. I don't have the numbers, uh, but it was extremely costly and it was determined that the community could not afford to do that. We're, uh, the costs are significantly more than putting in light rail on the surface and we're having a very hard time coming up with financing plans to even put, uh, extend the light rail line on these projects. So trying to fund something that would actually take it under the community from, from a demand standpoint as well as a financial standpoint, we're, n we're not ready for that yet. And that's what was determined by this um, study that was done. There was another question over Well, I'm just looking at your route. I'm looking at your route and you're, you're duplicating your capital costs by, uh, with light rail paralleling the uh, streetcar line, and there's only four blocks difference between those two projects. That's a lot of money to, for such a small area to, to, to be spending. Mm -hmm. how, how do you address that? I mean, if you look at First and Second Street, where you have your light rail now, what's wrong with going down those uh, rights away to the south end of downtown? We actually, we actually looked at, uh, as we add the interstate light rail and we add the the, the new 205 light rail line, as well as the uh, airport max line. That puts too many trains on the existing line down First Avenue and Morrison Yamhill. And it, it'll create congestion on that line and will hinder all north-south traffic. They, they just can't get, TriMet can't get that many trains on that system. So if we're gonna continue to expand our light rail system, add the 205 line, add the future Milwaukee line, we've got to have another corridor that can handle light rail through downtown. This has been in our planning efforts for a number of years and uh, the work that we're doing right now is just trying to implement that piece of our, our downtown plan. Now with respect to the streetcar, the streetcar operating characteristics are a lot different than light rail. Uh, streetcar mingles with traffic, it shares the traveling with automobile traffic where the light rail has its own exclusive right-of-way. And because of the size of the cars and the speed of the cars, um, uh, TriMet has always uh, held pretty firm to the fact that they need to have exclusive right-of-way for the light rail lines. Um, and where we feel with streetcar, 
it travels with traffic, and it's just a whole different type of uh, system. So trying to share the same track would be difficult, if not impossible. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I just have to add something to maybe help that gentleman's question. If you notice in the top right of the map there is Union Station and the Greyhound bus station. So one of the goals was to make a, you know, our, our, net, our region completely multimodal so you could go from the airport to the train station or the bus station. So that's one of the goals of going to the right there. That's correct. But also if you imagine right around Pioneer Courthouse Square trying to have a max uh, take a left turn, it would be very hard. So I think that's one of the other reasons. But my question is, and perhaps some of these questions might be better asked of a TriMet person, but do you happen to know if, uh, if this new lane is going to like uh, supplant some other bus lines? Uh, because if you're going to have so much action on the bus mall, mm -hmm. are we going to get rid of some bus lines? Well, we, I, I don't think we'd get rid of any bus lines. What we might do is move them off of 5th and 6th Avenue and put them on other corridors, uh, possibly 3rd uh, Avenue, 2nd Avenue, something like that. Um, we're, we're hoping that we can figure out a design so that we don't have to remove any bus lines, that we can keep both the buses and light rail and whatever automobile access that exists today can stay there. So. Uh. I'll just add a comment that on November 7th, uh, we have a seminar called Looking to TriMed's Future, and Alan Leto and Mark Roden will be here to talk in detail about the planning uh, efforts along the transit mall. So Great. please uh, come back and ask uh, even more questions then. Okay, sure. um, moving away from the downtown area, uh, once you essentially get past about 45th Avenue towards the east side, it really does become impossible to live without a car. I mean, you can't go shopping, you can't buy food. You, um, as the economy kind of shifts towards a concentration of larger, fewer grocery stores, for example, mm -hmm. um, you simply have to, to leave your house. You have to get in the car to you know, access anything. Right. Is, are there any plans at this point for... Uh, I realize that's more neighborhood development right. than just the transportation. Right. Uh, we, we have a lot of work to do in, again, what we call our town centers uh, to try to get them developed in a way that, that would work better for neighborhoods. Um, there are some town centers that are east of 45th Avenue, and if those could develop and be mixed-use type um, areas, then there are places where people live that would still have to drive their car, possibly, but there'll be more housing around those town centers so that people have an option of where they live so that they don't have to use the car. And that's, that's part of the whole land use um, policy and goals that we have in place is that we want to not only provide people with options to travel, we want to provide people options for where they live with respect to where they work and the kind of services they want to access. So the, the, those town centers and the Main Street areas, uh, we have a lot of work to do and hopefully over the next 20, 30 years they'll develop in such a way that more people can live closer to where they work and can can access services that are important to them. So. What are your ideas as far as uh, fulfilling your funding shortfalls? Have you looked at a street utility, establishing street utility? Uh, we actually uh, proposed to the city council two years ago, I think now, a street utility fee. Um, that would, I think it was around $1.85 per household uh, per month, and, uh, and a fairly significant charge to businesses also. And it was based on trips that are produced by, by property type. So homes typically produce 10 trips a day, so we figured out what the cost of a trip was, and we would charge a fee based on those 10 trips per day per home. Uh, businesses, they can generate you know, anywhere from 10 trips a day to thousands and thousands of trips per day. So uh, those that produce a lot of trips would pay a lot more. Um, certain businesses had um, a difficult time with that proposal and they referred it to um, a ballot. And when that happened, uh, the city council decided to pull back on the fee and didn't, didn't let it go to an election. So that got pulled back and a year ago we started uh, toying around with another different concept that provided a different kind of financing structure. But um, we never did actually lay that out to the citizens. Um, 
uh, we're thinking that at some time over the next two or three years, we're probably going to have to come back with another proposal along those lines. We, as part of that effort, we looked at all the various different type of funding options that are available to us, and that street fee option seemed to be the, the most uh, reasonable and practical to implement. This past year, the state legislature did up the amount of uh, registration fees and driver fees, uh, title fees, and we will be getting some proceeds from that, but not, near, not nearly enough to replenish all those cuts that I showed you previously. Um, it will help us with some of our preservation programs, but besides that, uh, it will just kind of keep us whole and keep us steady for a little while. So that's why I anticipate in the next few years we're going to have to figure out another way to, to generate some additional revenue. Yes. Um, advanced technology. Here. Um, I was wondering who's paying for the tram. I am, is OHSU paying for the entire project? Uh, as part of that development agreement that I was telling you about, um, we have a number of transportation projects that we need to build in South Waterfront area, as as well as the tram that goes up to the to OHSU. And through the Portland Development Commission that has tax increment financing available to it. Uh, along with OHSU and some of the development uh, charges that we have in transportation, we've developed a package to build all those transportation facilities. Um, for the tram specifically, the vast majority of it is being paid for by OHSU. So um, that's the one key component of that entire transportation system that's going in that's so important to OHSU, so they're, they're putting up most of the dollars for that. Where the, the total cost for the tram is somewhere between 15 and 17 million dollars right now. So. Another question over here. Has any serious discussion been done on uh, the London pricing model, the congestion pricing model, as a, as a way to raise revenue in Portland? Uh, there hasn't been a serious discussion based upon their model. Uh, the met uh, Metro itself has looked at congestion pricing throughout kind of the, the, the metro area and accessing into the metro area. And um, I don't know exactly what all the results of that study are, but uh, they have not implemented any of the congestion pricing pieces that they looked at. But I, I know they went through a fairly detailed study of, of congestion pricing, and it was basically which key facilities coming into downtown could we actually set up some kind of pricing mechanism that would work. Um, and I think they determined that they couldn't really focus in on just one or two because of the impacts and the shift of travel that would occur, people going different directions if they had to deal with that. One thing that's uh, <clears throat> happening at the state level is there's a group that's looking at ways to do, I guess you'd say, some kind of pricing based on mileage that's GPS based for all automobiles. And they're doing a, uh, here in the next year or so, they're going to be doing a test on a few hundred vehicles to see if the system could actually work as far as tracking vehicles, how many miles they, they drive, and then uh, assessing them based on the, the number of miles they drive. And uh, that, that has a lot of potential, I understand. Um, it would have to be con combined with also a gas tax because you have a lot of people coming in from out of state that drive through, through Oregon, of course, and so you'd have to have both a gas tax and this other kind of GPS-based fee that would be in place. Any other questions? Or, yes. Um, back when you were talking about um, buses having signal priority, I was wondering if you could tell me um, some places where that's currently being implemented. Uh, I believe it's on some of the east-west lines. I believe possibly Powell or Division. Um, and I'm, I apologize, I'm not sure which line it is, but I believe it's either Powell or Division, or both of those. So. Thank you. Question back here. Here's just, uh, we, we have a simulation of the actual light rail line going down the mall. And unfortunately, I didn't bring the full simulation, but it's pretty impressive. Uh, the, the makers of the simulation really did a wonderful job in that you can, the train is going down the track and, and the camera is following it. And the camera actually swings around the other side as the train continues to move down the track. And it really gives you a good perspective of what it means to, to put light rail on the mall. 
And it's going to this simulation tool is going to be wonderful for us as we you know work with uh, uh, community members and we go through planning processes for our projects to let people really see what they're what we're talking about is, is trade-offs with different projects. Uh, it's a little costly right now, but given the importance of this particular project, we felt that it was uh, appropriate to do a simulation model. This is just one slide out of that simulation, but you can see how it looks fairly real, and it, you know, it looks like the light rail could, could be sitting out there right now. Uh, this is just one concept. Uh, here's another concept that uh, provides for that through auto lane on the left side, uh, the light rail line right adjacent to it, and then a center platform, and the buses then are on the right side. And again, the, the problem with this is that you do have the center platform, which uh, uh, transit riders probably won't like very much, uh, being out in the middle of the street, and access to that island probably won't be very uh, pedestrian friendly. And for one, you have buses right to your back there, adjacent to the island, and that's not very conducive to a good environment. And uh, it's narrowed up the sidewalk width, and this probably uh, isn't the kind of proposal that will um, be looked upon real favorably. Um, so we're looking at some other options that, that doesn't have the buses right adjacent to the island platform and see if there's, we can still provide an auto lane but not have that close uh, uh, environment between the light rail and bus for the people waiting for uh, the, the light rail line. Question? The buses and the max line will intermingle. Is that's how people will be able to board the buses? And then the vehicles have their own through lane, is that correct? Uh, that, that's correct. The, the light rail stops will be every uh, four blocks, I believe, and bus stops then will be in the inter interim three blocks. And so when the buses are at their stops, the light they're not on the light rail line, but when they move out, they might go down the light rail line and get around. The, the light rail here to get to their stop beyond it. There's another question here too. Yes. So the buses will be stopping in the light rail line to pick up people. Uh, again, we're not sure what the final configuration. Again, we, they won't be stopping actually on the line itself because that we we've got to make sure that the uh, light rail line can can run without any interruption. They may have to swing out onto the light rail line to get um, to get around a bus and then to get back into the bus lane. Is there a, a picture of that, Glenn? Uh, I don't have it with me, but um, if you wanted to see these simulations, they're actually on TriMet's website. Uh, you have to have all the right software to, to run them. Uh, or go to any of the open houses that are, are going to be happening. Um, we, I think there's three open houses coming up here in October. Um, and you could go and we'll actually have the simulations there, and you can see how they actually will work. Any other questions? That uh, is pretty much what I had to talk with you about today. If uh, if you had any follow-up questions or changing the subject quite a bit, cities like Denver are now reinstalling cobblestones and brick pavers because of the aesthetics in the city. With this rediscovery of downtowns and reurbanization. The public likes that. Now, I know right. the transportation department, as of a very few years ago, was adamantly opposed to brick pavers. Has any change in that attitude occurred? Well, there's. Uh, I guess we've cracked the door a little bit on that attitude. Um, the, the one problem that we have with the brick pavers and cobblestones is that they're very costly to maintain. And in an environment that we're in right now where we're short of resources to even maintain the uh, uh, asphalt and concrete streets that we have right now, it doesn't seem very prudent on our part to go in and allow uh, cobblestones and uh, pavers to be put in. Where we are interested in exploring this is if we can work with developers and property owners in a certain area, if, <clears throat> if they're okay with paying for ma the increased maintenance costs, then we'll be fine with it as, as, as long as it works from a transportation standpoint. Um, we have a, we have ADA re <coughs> excuse me ADA requirements access requirements, and some of those cobblestones are too rough for certain types of users, and so we've got to make sure that uh, of course it complies with all of our requirements for use. 
But yeah, Have the, any the, developers the, asked for that? I mean, the reason oh, yes. I'm asking is, for example, around the edge, the building, the edge over on 14th, that's cobblestone street. I mean, right. it's in pretty bad shape, but there are cobblestones there. There are cobblestones down in the river district. And I'm just wondering if Homer Williams or, or, um, or Ball or any of those guys wants to preserve that or enhance it. Uh, there are several developers in that area that are interested in preserving and enhancing that. Um, of course, their initial thought was that you know the city would just take that on, but um, we're we're actually looking at that right now to see what the maintenance practices would be for trying to keep those as well as providing new ones, and we're going to be looking at, at at that issue over this next year. So, it's a good question. Yes. Can you talk about a, a position on the um, I guess the court ruling regarding? bringing roadways up to ADA compliance with, with pavement, uh, restoration and pavement overlay work? Have we looked at, excuse me? There was a, a ruling out of Sacramento where uh, there That's was a right. decision made. If, you, if, you're, if you're overlaying the street, you've got to bring it up to ADA compliance. Mm -hmm. Has PDOT come to any conclusions on how they're going to handle that? Uh, we, we worked with um, uh, our disability community. Um, uh, it was probably five, ten years ago, and worked on a program where we would allocate money for putting in uh, curb cuts and uh, accessible uh, sidewalks throughout the city using this fund of money. We wouldn't follow our, our paving program around the city, but we would use that pot of money to deal with key locations where we wanted to make the system as accessible as possible. And the, the committee that we worked with, they felt very good about that uh, approach to dealing with accessibility issues. And to date, it's been, still been working for us very well. Um, we, more, we deal with it more strategically so that we determine where accessibility issues are throughout the city, and then we can put our resources into those areas. And if we get calls that um, someone has just moved into a location and they can't get to a a local store or whatever, we'll look at that route and we'll use some of the money from that fund to make sure that there's uh, sidewalk ramps and it's accessible all the way to the, the, the destination. Um, so that's worked for us. Uh, we do understand that that ruling is out there as far as the actual paving program. Um, if we went that direction, it would be a significant uh, change in how we do business and um, we're, we're not fiscally able to deal with that right now. So. Well, before we thank our speaker, um, I'd like to announce that next week we'll be talking about modeling freight and passenger rail capacity in the I-5 freight corridor, and Bill Virgil and Mark Ford will be here from HDR to talk about that subject. So we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks for your good questions, and thanks for a great talk, Fran. So let's thank you.